In this video, I'm going to show you how to conduct an NEA1 investigation, or just show you an example of how one could be conducted. A couple of things I want you to be aware of before you actually start your NEA1 investigation. That's the practical part that you'll be doing in your classrooms. One, it's important to be clear about exactly what it is you're investigating. If you're in a big class and everyone starts investigating, everyone starts doing their practicals, it's very easy to just get carried away in trying to get something done as quickly as possible, because in most cases you have an hour or less, um, but, but you can very easily under all circumstances forget exactly the point of what exactly it is you're actually investigating and just get excited about making something. So clearly have in your mind, what exactly am I investigating? The next point that's essential is to make sure you've got prepared instructions that you're that you're going to follow. Uh, again, a practical lesson um, when you're doing investigations can be very, very busy inside the classroom. You need to have clear instructions that you've written down for yourself that you understand, that you follow on the day of the practical. It's important for two reasons. One, it's important um, to give you the instructions to follow step by step so you know what you're doing. And two, it's essential evidence that goes into your report. That's part of the preparation for investigation. So you need to have written instructions in your report as evidence and also clearly written instructions for how you're going to conduct the actual experiment. And that needs to be very practical. For example, uh, exactly how much, how much sugar you're going to use, exactly how, uh, how many eggs or exactly what the ingredients are you're going to use, specifically exact amounts, etc. Um, very essential that you have those specific instructions to make your practical run a lot more efficiently. Another tip that's worth bearing in mind is the fact that because you're not making food to eat, you're just making sample batches of whatever it is you're doing. Uh, most recipes will have large amounts uh, appropriate for if you're making a meal of something, but we're not making a meal. So whatever the recipe is, uh, scale it down so, you, so you're making a small batch. So if the recipe says, for example, if you're making bread, it says you use 200 grams. Um, if you're making different types of bread using different types of flour, you'd scale that down to maybe uh, 50 grams of flour. So you scale it down uh, that much, just so you're making small batches as opposed to big large things. One, it makes it quicker for you to do in the practical, and it's gonna make it, in most cases, quicker to cook as well. Because the practical, you've got to be able to make it in one lesson and have some time enough to record in detail um, exactly what you're doing and your results. Which brings me on to the next part. You must, must, must take picture evidence of your investigations throughout. Picture evidence with your name showing. If you do not have picture evidence with your name showing, you may have a, done a wonderful investigation, but without the picture evidence of going in your report, it's as if you never did it. So please, please, please make sure you have picture evidence of your work. So picture evidence with a name showing. So make sure you've got yourself a name tag, this character a student called, Harry Peters. So make sure in every shot that you take, you have your picture showing. Now, uh, you may have a camera or the teacher may have a camera, or you may be allowed to use a camera on your mobile phone, which seems to be a practical way to do that. But make sure that every stage in your investigation, you are taking picture evidence. This is a must. Without picture evidence, you will have to do your practical again. And there may or may not be time for you to do that. That's important. Okay, we've covered all the basics. So I guess now we're just about ready to start. So in this particular video, for my investigation, if you remember back to the previous video when we were uh, looking at how to analyze a brief, the brief I chose was about uh, the function or the role of eggs uh, in making meringues and also the other ingredients that are used to make meringues because that's the particular brief that I chose for the example for this video. So I've done my research and one of the things that I've discovered in my research was the fact that um, caster sugar as I believe, is the best sugar to use for meringues. Now, from my research, it said that uh, caster sugar is best to use because it's very, very fine, still quite sweet, and when whisked, the fine granules very easily dissolve into the mixture. So for that reason, um, I've chosen caster sugar as my prediction. So in my hypothesis, I said that I predict that caster sugar will be the best sugar to use to make meringues because its fine consistency will dissolve quickly into the mixture. That's my prediction, that's my hypothesis. Now to prove my prediction or my hypothesis, I'm going to um, make meringues 
three ways. So I'm going to keep the standard recipe or the standard process or method the same, but only in changing, only changing the one ingredient um, that I'm focusing on. So for this particular practical, I'm going to try meringues with three different types of sugar. One batch with um, cast sugar, another batch with soft brown sugar, and another batch with granulated sugar. So it's all about sugar. So sugar is the only element that I'm going to be looking to change in this particular practical. Everything else should stay the same. So whatever it is, whichever practical or whichever investigation thing you're choosing as well, it's important that control-wise or control uh, the elements around the investigation that help make it consistent and fair throughout. So controls are such things like make sure that, for example, in my meringues, um, the eggs are whisked for exactly the same amount of time for each one. So that one batch does not have an advantage over another. Or make sure that all the other ingredients used are exactly the same, with only that one element that you're changing being the different thing. So whether it's meringues or bread or whatever the investigation thing happens to be that, you'll get from, that you've chosen from um, the options you're given, make sure each time you do an investigation, you're only investigating a particular thing. So try and keep all of the controls about the same so that when you do a different batch, only the ingredient or the process or whatever it, whatever it is you've chosen is the different element which makes it clearer to evaluate if there is a change or if, there, if one thing has an advantage over another. Okay, to start with, from my research I discovered that uh, the optimum type of amount of sugar uh, per egg is 50 grams. Now again, that's something I can investigate if I were to do another investigation, that's something I could, a, a hypothesis I could test, but I'm going to use that as a base from which to investigate the sugar. So I'm not talking about the, ra the ratio of sugar at the moment, I'm just talking about the amount. So to make my practical run easier, first thing I'm going to do is measure out 50 grams of each of the sugars so I can have it ready to quickly put in as I'm making, uh, as I'm producing the, the meringues themselves. So the first thing is, I'm going to weigh out 50 grams each of the different types of sugar, put them to, put them to one side, ready to incorporate into the egg whites when they get whisked. At each stage of the investigation, be diligent and remember the differences between ingredients because that could become significant. So even as I'm pouring out my sugar, I'm noting that the, brown, the soft brown sugar seems to stick together a lot more because it's less refined, it has more of the original stickiness, the more of the original molasses still left in it. So it's a lot stickier, it smells quite different. So even already, I've got something that, I've got quite a difference. I've got two products that look different and smell different and consistency-wise, they're different. So any, any interesting points along the way that you discover between the different types of sugar or different types of ingredients, just have a little piece of paper and make a note of it because that will become significant later on. Okay, so for me, if I was making notes, I'd put, have a quick note and say, um, cashew sugar, very fine, brown sugar, quite aromatic, a little bit sticky, clumps together a bit more. And I'll see if that has a factor when I use it later because I'll be able to refer back to that as an interesting point. Right, I have my three different sugars. Another, interest, another important point, make sure you label each sugar as you're going along. Now, I know what I'm doing here, but even so, it's very easy if ingredients look the same to forget which is which. For example, castor and granulated sugar, they look almost identical. So it's important that as you're doing it, you either color code them or do something which allows you to remember which ingredient is which, because it's very easy if these things are to get mixed up to forget which one is which. And that could significantly hamper uh, your, your investigation results if you get confused between the different ingredients. So make sure you either color code, have them in different containers and say, for example, green, I'll make a note and say green, it's got granulated sugar, that kind of thing. Or make, how, whatever system you use, make sure that you are You've got something in place so you don't get your ingredients mixed up. So for me, I'd probably label these, have them in different colours, but then make sure I'm doing one thing at a time. So for this one, I've got caster sugar in here. So the first batch I'm going to do is going to be with caster sugar. So I'm going to make my meringues. Now meringues use only the egg white. 
And it's important that we use only the egg white because if we have any of the, the yellow part, any of the fat part in the middle, then that's going to prevent the foam from forming. And I discovered that as part of my research. So, very carefully, toss one to the other, making sure not to get any of the yolk in. So I have just the yolk in there. Now I whisk until it forms thick peaks. Okay, we have stiff peaks. So at this point, I'm going to add the sugar. Now I've used uh, a texture indication as opposed to a time indication because mixing, mixing things like egg whites are not an exact science. Sometimes the egg might be warmer or cooler or something, so one may, be, may whisk quicker than the other. But if I whisk them all the egg whites to the same consistency, then I've got a good control on my investigation, which means that I've got good accurate parameters. So when I add the sugar, they're all being added when the eggs have reached the same kind of thickness. So I'm going to add in my caster sugar, because this is the first experiment is all about the caster sugar. Remember, make sure you know which one's which, and then we'll see what happens. Beautiful, soft peaks. Look at that. So it comes off thickly. It's enough to hang and support its own weight. So I'm going to make sure that each one I produce is, is whisked to this kind of consistency. Remember to take pictures at every stage with your name showing. So you whisk some meringues, you take a picture. Next, I'm going to prepare my baking tray. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to have three columns. One with cast sugar, one with granulated, one with brown. This again helps me make sure I don't get confused because once they're in the oven, I may be I may lose track of which ingredient is which. So I'm gonna put castor for the first column. Middle column, I'm gonna put granulated. And then for the final column, I'm just gonna put brown. So I've got my three columns clearly labelled. Next, I'm going to take and try and put three samples down there. The key thing is making sure they're all about the same size. Again, it's all about controls because if, if batches aren't the same size, then they're not going to cook at the same rate. Uh, so control-wise, the aim is to make sure that each one of the batches for each one of the ingredients is exactly the same. If one pile is massive and another one small, then while one is cooking and drying out, the other one may not cook all the way through which means you've not got an accurate test. So the part of the skill is making sure, and you'd make sure you'd make a point of this in your research, in your, in your report, is to say that I made sure that each one was about the same size. So let's have a go at doing that. Spoonful. Put it down. Boom, three batches, all as close as I can make it, exactly the same. So I've got one row down, cast sugar. All what I do now is repeat the exact same process for the brown and for the granulated. Okay, I've now completed making each one of the meringues. I've not made them yet. What's important that I would suggest even at this stage is to get a piece of paper, and record any differences you can see even before they're baked. So for example, I will talk about colour. The two ones in white on this hand and so appear to be about the same colour. The brown one, obviously the brown sugar makes, uh, makes the meringues a mixture brown, that's to be expected. Something which is a bit more unusual, which you wouldn't come across, say for example, is smell. Um, the castor and the granulator have no real aroma whatsoever, 
whereas the brown one has a really rich, almost toffee slice slash coffee type aroma, which is that's an important point to note. It may be significant, it may not be significant, but when you're assessing things in a sensory way, using senses, i.e. what they look like, what they smell like, what they feel like, then take every opportunity to record down sensual, sensory information. As I look closely as well, I can just about see that the granulated sugar, uh, I can see little slight grains of granules of sugar, which don't look like they've fully dissolved properly into the mixture. Uh, the soft brown sugar, that appears to be nice and smooth, although it does have dark spots in it from maybe the clumps of dark sticky sugar which didn't fully blend. So already I've got a good amount of information before I've even done anything else. And I would, what I would do, I would record this accurately on a piece of paper and that would be incorporated into my report in the investigation section. The investigation section is all about conducting the investigation and recording information. You're not analysing it, you're not making sense of it at the moment, you're just accurately recording information. Okay, while uh, the meringues are in the oven uh, and you've tied it up, it gives you an opportunity to set out a, a method of recording the results when they come out of the oven. So one method that, that I, I use with my students is a star diagram. Now there, there are a variety of different methods, I've got a few examples here. Um, but you can use any method you choose or find or your teacher offers you. Um, star diagram, this is a sensory analysis chart, I'll go for that in a minute. We also have a like-dislike chart, again quite simple. Um, you've got your various samples and you rank in terms of dislike at one end to like at the other end. You rank along there, uh, preference-wise, which ones you prefer. So you might put brown sugar as a sample, like to dislike, and you get a variation between like and dislike, and you'll be able to see which one, just in terms of preference, you like or dislike the most. So useful, but not numerically accurate, but it can give you an indication of which one you like or dislike the most. So we might use that one at some point. A ranking test, very similar, but then puts a little bit more numeracy into it. So you are ranking them, the sample, so put brown sugar in terms of first, second, or third. You rank it in terms of where you think it's come uh, depending on how many batches you did. So, for example, for this one, we did three batches, one with caster sugar, one with granulated, and one with brown. So, potentially, we could rank them in terms of the preference. This one's just ranking them in terms of like and dislike. This one here is ranking them in terms of preference. Which ones do you prefer the sample uh, most? So, first, second, third, or fourth or fifth, depending on how many things you're ranking. That's a useful one. Again, another variation of the same theme in a different format, a table. I like very much to, I dislike very much. The good thing about a form like this is that it allows you to put a comments or add a reason why. So all these are variations along the same one, but depending on what you're doing, you choose which one you think works the best. So this is a quite useful one because you get a like, dislike, like the others. You, if you wanted to, you could add the number value to it as well. But then in particular, you could add a comment so you could state why you like or dislike. That's quite useful. Again, if you're only doing two samples, we're doing more, so it's not directly related. Again, it's a preference one. Which one do you prefer? So for now, I'll put this to one side. We're going to do a star chart or a star diagram. And around the outside are sensory inputs we can choose. So for example, let's think, what sensory things can we choose to help us assess our um, meringues? Okay, so this is my sensory diagram to record sensory information when my meringues come out of the oven. Very important that you get this done, or ideally have this already done before the practical so that uh, while you're washing up, you may not have time to produce one of these, but have it ready so as soon as it comes out, you can taste and record straight away. So, around the outside, a sensory analysis means that we're using our senses. So that would be our taste, our smell, what they look like, our sight, our touch. Hearing doesn't really factor into it so much, but we use our five senses as best we can. If, if it was something that was required to make a noise or something like that, or crunch, but we'll use our senses. So here we go. First one we're gonna look at, I'm gonna put it in, is aroma. Now this particular uh, star chart has already been pre-prepared and it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight input sections. I'm not gonna be using eight, so Again, if you're doing your own, you could very easily draw out a uh, star chart using a ruler 
um, very, very quickly if you wanted to do one yourself. Um, but these are already pre-printed, so useful to use. So first one, I'm going to put aroma. That's what it smells like using my senses, my smell. Uh, next, I'm going to look at uh, colour. Now again, in terms of colour, it would be completely arbitrary unless you were gauging it against something. So, I'm gonna th so from my research, it should have given me an indication of what should a good meringue look like. So I'm basing the colour based on what my research said it should look like. Not necessarily what I prefer. How close does it get to the pictures or the different things I've seen of what they should look like. Uh, next, I'm going to put in um, texture. Once more, my research should have given me an indication of what it would be an expected or a good texture to expect from a meringue. Next, I'm just going to put two more and I'm going to put appearance, what they look like, what should they look like. So what colour should it be? Look like take, brings into consideration things like shape. So did it maintain its shape while it was, while it was baking? Did it collapse? Did it fall? So appearance and colour are similar, but not exactly the same. And finally, uh, which is probably a very, very important factor, is taste. Now this becomes a bit more subjective down to, um, it might come down to things like which one you actually prefer. Right, so we have our one, two, three, four, five sensory inputs that we can use to record. Now we need to have a colour key for each one. So you can do this quite simply. Uh, for example, I'm going to use, to keep it simple, I'm going to use yellow, I'm going to put a little key at the bottom, so I'm going to put yellow equals caster, blue equals granulated, and then go brown equals brown sugar. So that's my key. So now all I'll do is wait for my ingredients to come out of the oven, and then I'm going to test each one based on this criteria. Okay, and we're back. Our meringues are out of, fresh out of the oven. So very quickly, we need to start evaluating them. So using the star diagram we just created, uh, we have aroma, colour, texture, appearance, taste. First thing I do, aroma, I'm going to smell them. So I'm going to take one. Now, bear in mind it's a dessert. I'm looking for something that I find appealing as a, as a dessert. So I'm smelling this one. Smell a little bit of caramelization, but it also smells a little bit eggy. This one smells very, very similar. So the, the caster sugar and the granulated sugar smell very eggy. But the brown sugar, that smells almost, caram almost caramelly. That's a really nice smell. So just in terms of smell, let's start to rank them. So first of all, caster sugar. On a scale of one to 10, how am I gonna rate the caster sugar? Well, I smell a bit eggy, which isn't appealing for a dessert to actually smell the egg and the granulated sugar was the same. So I'm going to put that for me round about four. So I'm going to put a yellow blob on my mark, on my t star diagram around about four uh, for cast sugar. That was very, very similar. So I'm going to put also to the side at about four. There's a brown sugar, that smells really nice, really nice. So I'm going to put that right up at about eight. So straight away, we can see how our table's starting to take, starting to take shape. Next, we're looking at colour. Now again, these are kind of subjective in a way, um, but I'm going to judge colour based on, from what my research, a meringue is supposed to look like. Now, meringues, typically speaking, are very, very pale, white with highlights of brown, depending on how you do it, but quite pale uh, is, is how, a meringue, how we'd expect a meringue to look. So in that regard, the casa sugar, I think that has to rank the highest, because that's a, the palest and the, has the most consistent, smooth colour throughout. So I'm going to put that quite high in terms of what it's supposed to look like. From what I've seen, I'm going to rank that at about a seven. Next, uh, colour-wise, is a granulated, which is similarly pale, but when you look into it quite closely, you can still see, it looks like it's speckled 
where maybe the, the, the grains of caster sugar have not dissolved. So it's not got a nice even tone. So that kind of knocks the mark right down for me. That. So I'm going to put that around about four. And then the brown sugar, it's, it's, it's consistency wise, it appears to be somewhere between the two, but we we're only ranking color. It is brown. Now, typically speaking, meringues aren't brown. So we always knew that was going to hamper it. So again, brown for, a, for color, um, I'm going to put brown sugar around about a four. We always knew that that would hamper it. And, and then caster sugar, granulated sugar, I'm going to also put as a four. So because the granulated sugar is not an even tone, it's speckled because you can see that individual grains of, of um, sugar have not dissolved properly. The brown sugar doesn't have that to the same extent, but then again, it is brown. And we know that a typical meringue should be much paler in color. So, they, so for color wise, they both ranked around about four. Next, we're going to have to go to, I'm going to swing across, because it's related, I'm going to look at parents. Similar kind of ranking. Uh, the granulated, the cast sugar, that's got really good appearance. It's quite pale. Um, it's smooth. It looks even. It's got, it's kept a good shape. That's going to have to rank quite high for me, that. So I'm going to take the yellow. And for appearance, I'm going to rank that round about eight overall. So that's ranked quite highly. Granulated one, quite disappointing. Uh, Shape-wise, it's kept a similar shape. But when you look closely into it, you can see that it's all, the sugar hasn't fully dissolved and it's all speckled throughout. It's very granulated, very, very grainy. So appearance wise, I'm gonna have to again, rank that down at round about four, get the right pencil color crane this time. Four. Uh, the brown sugar, purely based on appearance, taking the color out of it, it's, got, it's kept its shape well, it's quite smooth, but not quite as smooth as a caster sugar. So that's going to be some in between. So I'm going to put that up at round about six. Which means the final category we've got to look at is taste. Here's where we have a bit of fun. Here's where we taste each one. Okay, the final category that we have to record now is arguably the most important one, which would be taste. So, so far we've covered the aroma, what it smells like, colour and appearance, both to do with what they look like. Texture, ah, we haven't covered texture yet. So texture and taste requires us to start to interact with the product. So here we go. Now, texture is a bit of a tricky one because meringues can be, um, when you read the results, you say it, it can have um, different types of texture. So it's a little bit tricky on that because it, depending on how long you leave them in the oven for, if you cook them until they cook on the outside and leave them in the oven, some people say they need to dry out so they're completely crispy. Some people say, uh, some recipes suggest that you leave them and then they should be a little bit chewy. But whatever they are, we're going to have to judge them based on how long they've been in the oven. So I would imagine that these should be crispy on the outside, but a little bit chewy on the inside. So let's go dig in texture wise. Nice. If you can hear that, crisp on the outside, with a little bit of a gooey texture on, on the middle. Okay, hard to know what this one here, try this one. A little bit crispy on the outside, equally gooey on the inside. It's a little bit, the texture on the inside is very much like a marshmallow. So that's texture wise. Kind of hard to know how to, how to judge this one. Let's see what this one's like. Again, a little bit softer on the outside texture wise. So it's not got the same crisp on the outside, but equally softer on the, on the inside. Very difficult to know how to judge this one. It does become a little bit preference wise. Uh, I like the crisp on the outside, so they're both Caster and granite have crisp on the outside, and they have both kind of, they're all kind of similar on the inside. So I'm going to rank caster and granulated about the same, with the brown sugar being a little bit further behind, but not by much. So texture wise, I'm going to rank 
10, 9, 8, 7. I'm going to rank them castor and granulated about the same on 7, with a brown a little bit further behind on 6. And then finally, taste. So this again becomes uh, quite subjective. So I'm just going to go really which one I prefer the taste of the most and rank accordingly. So here we go. Mm. Little chewy in sound, but I like that. Mm. Quite nice, that. Sweet. Chewy. A little bit light, nice flavour. Okay, it's not bad. Let's see what this one tastes like by comparison. A little bit chewy on the inside, which I'm not hating. Maybe a little bit too chewy. But very, very similar in taste. Taste maybe a little bit sweeter. Yeah, it tastes a little bit sweeter than the cast sugar, but very similar in taste. I'll taste the brown sugar. Want some of your brown sugar? All right, here we go, brown sugar. Now the brown sugar on this one gives it a really interesting characterful flavour. The first two just taste sweet, but the brown sugar in this one really does make the flavour different. There's a lot of character, a bit of caramelisation coming off it, almost toffee-like. So in terms of taste, the brown sugar is actually much nicer than the other. These two just taste plain, but this has a distinct flavour in and of itself. Not just sweet, but very distinct. Mm. Mm. Brown sugar is clearly for me, the nicest tasting. All right, so that says really good. So I'm gonna put brown sugar taste-wise right up at a nine. And the castor, uh, I'm gonna put a couple, couple marks behind it, around about seven. With the granulated bringing up the rear at six. Okay, we've completed adding the data inputs for our spider slash star chart. Now all we need to do is connect the dots. A little bit of fun. You get a ruler, and this is what creates the star type shape. So connect all the yellow dots together. Do a nice neat job because this will feature as part of your report that gets sent off for your GCSE. Now the brown sugar, that's quite, that's quite interesting because we can look and we can see that it's done well in certain areas and not so well in others. But let's see if we can really go another step further and break down and put some values to each one of these categories. So because we now know that each one of these dots relates to an actual um, number, we can add a number overall value of each one and that'll help us when we look to draw some conclusions. So I'm gonna go ahead Add up the value for each one, one of the um, sugar granite, for each one of the different types of sugar, and then see which one overall has scored the highest. And this helps us when we start to draw conclusions. So that's our invest. That's one of our investigations done. Now. It doesn't say specifically exactly how many investigations you should do, but as a general rule, I tell my students three investigations. It's possible you could get away with two if your investigations are quite complicated and detailed. So if they have lots of facets to them and lots of things to set up, then maybe you can get away with two investigations if one of them is really detailed or really complicated. But as a general rule, think three investigations. That's three things or three ingredients or something to look into or three processes that relate to what you're doing. Now this is just one 
of those three. We, we explored which ingredient was best to make, which type of sugar was best to make meringues. Now, from my research, you would have known that my prediction was that caster sugar, based on my research, I thought would be best because it's fine granules, um, mixes into the, into the ingredients well, it's got quite a neutral taste. Um, research suggested that that would be the best outcome. So that was my prediction. So my hypothesis was that caster sugar would give the best results when making meringues. Now, what we discovered from our first way of analyzing or first way of recording information from our experiment, from my investigation, was that in terms of numerical values, that's why it's important to be able to incorporate that, caster sugar and brown sugar ranked the same. They both had 32 points because while caster sugar outscored brown sugar in some areas, brown sugar outscored caster in some areas. So then by way of a tiebreaker, you have to start to think, okay, well, does that mean it's a draw? Or can I look into it in a little bit more detail? Now, looking into it a little bit more detail would be to, would be to suggest that, okay, they're both right the same in terms of um, numerical value, um, but does, are all the sensory elements valued the same? So is texture and colour, are they as important as aroma and taste? Or is there one element that I think is the most important, so that if something scores highest in here, then if it's a tiebreaker, that might outweigh it or outrank it. So I decided that to break the tie, I thought taste would be a tiebreaker. So whichever one of the two that were scoring the same, caster and brown, whichever one scored highest in the taste, I'd let that be the decider because ultimately the proof of the pudding, they say, is in the eating. So it's all down to what it ultimately tastes like. Although the other elements are important, taste, would, I would say, would be the ultimate decider. So of these two, it was brown sugar that ranked the highest in terms of taste, which means that, that my hypothesis was incorrect. That's fine. That's good. That's interesting. These investigations aren't about you predicting something and then proving necessarily that what you predicted was right. As long as you've got a logical hypothesis, you've got research to back up why you've thought that would happen, and you conducted a logical um, investigation, it's more interesting sometimes if you find out that actually I thought this would happen. However, when I conducted my investigation, I recorded the data, I got a result which I wasn't expecting. So as long as you can explain and articulate all the reasons that go into it, that still leaves you heading towards top marks. What you don't want to do is try and bend or falsify or curb your results just to make them match up with your hypothesis, because that's not, that's not necessary. If it's wrong, it's wrong. As long as you've got good reason for it, that's perfectly fine. But what's important is that you write it up accurately. Now, there's more than one way, as we discussed earlier, of how to record information. I've used a star chart slash spider diagram slash uh, star chart slash diagram to record the information from this particular practical. But also what's very important is your picture evidence. Just to reiterate, you must have pictures of what you've done. And another way to record the information is that you can take the pictures Put the pictures, if you're doing it a hard copy or online or using, um, if you're doing it on the computer, import, import your pictures into the document and then annotate your pictures in the document itself. So you put the pictures in your report and then you draw a little arrow in the report and describe, annotate your pictures. There's also a section on the mark scheme that talks about different ways of recording information and recording it via photographs with annotation is a valid one. So there's lots of different ways for you to record your information. Star diagrams, tables, um, survey sheets, different types of things, but also annotating folks photographs is a valid way of recording information. So that's just an example of how to do one particular investigation. Now, I don't know what investigations you're going to be doing because I don't know the brief you're going to have, but it's the same principle that's involved. I pick, usually you're going to be investigating how a particular ingredient works or how a particular process works. For example, I could just have easily for this practical I've chosen to, to work out, well, from my research, I predict that using a food processor would give better results than hand whisking. So using a hand, uh, electric whisk of a hand whisk. Um, some recipes may say either. So then what, what I would do was that I would beep, try and do one set with a hand whisk, uh, with a hand whisk, and the other one with the electric whisk and see which one produced the best results. So that's me analysing a process. 
So depending on what you're doing, you could be either doing an investigation which looks at a process or how a particular ingredient works or functions or performs. So we've got our results. I'll do two more investigations if I were going, if I were going to do it for myself, which I'm not. I'm just going to demonstrate one. And then the next section which we'll go on to in our next video would be how to evaluate and analyze the results. This information here really is just predominantly data. We're not putting any real value onto it yet. Even talking about which one outranks the other one in terms of taste, that really should go into the final section. So I've been a little bit naughty there. So we should really put that information into the final section when we draw our conclusions. So for now, what we've got is data that suggests that at the moment, cashew sugar and brown sugar seem to rank the same. When I look to evaluate the data and analyze it in the next section, that's when I'll really start to pull apart the difference between the two ingredients that rank the same to see if I can draw some kind of conclusion, i.e. which one do I prefer, uh, which one ranks the highest in taste, with my reasons why. What's important with these investigations is that you always put your reasons why. In your class, it's very likely that lots of other students are going to be doing exactly the same investigations as you. It's very likely. There's only so many things you can investigate depending on what brief you've got. So what becomes more, more important is how accurately you record the information uh, and the conclusions you draw from that information. Because it's the conclusions you draw from it that lets the people marking it know, oh, they understand what they're doing. Their conclusions suggest that they understand the function of that ingredient and the reasons why. So showing you understand the results and the reasons why they happened, that's where a lot of the high level marks are gonna come from because everyone's gonna have pretty much the same kind of research, maybe even the same kind of tables, maybe the same methods, but how accurately you do it, that's what's gonna separate you in terms of the higher mark bands.